Well, Dr. Kurt Thompson, it's so great to have you on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for joining me. Dave, thank you so much. It's great to be here. You know, we we jump on oftentimes with guests, and I don't know you, and you don't meet, know me except for you know a, a few minutes of just some interchange beforehand. But I can already tell I'm. This is going to be such a wonderful, rich conversation, um, mm. just by your spirit and your demeanor. And so I'm mm. just so grateful for g- giving us the mm. time and letting mm. our community just really glean from your work and what you're doing in the world. Well, it's uh, as I my my friends know that I say that I don't deserve my life, and. Uh, mm. uh, this would be one more uh, reason for why that's true. So it's it's great to be able to. I mean, the whole notion of uh, uh, the on ramp to your podcast, you know, the events that uh, foreshadowed it, mm. uh, and the people that have been drawn to it as a result to tell their stories as you were describing that they have. Uh, Mm -hmm. Those are the stories of people who are, you know, working their tails off to get through their days. That's right. And uh, so for people who know what it means to work really hard to live in the real world, uh, it's, it's always humbling and an honor to be in the room with you. So thanks for having me. Mm. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, why don't you just give us a little bit of, you know, kind of preface to to who you are in case <laughs> in case some of our listeners have, have never heard of you. Tell us, you know, who you are, what your family's like, where you live. Just give us a kind of a overview of Dr. Kurt Thompson. Yeah, uh, 10,000 foot flyby. I uh, am the fourth of four sons. Grew up in a mm. very small town in o- eastern Ohio. Uh, no stoplights, 800 people in that town called Mount Pleasant. Uh, my brothers were 18, 16, and 11. When I was born, my parents were in their mid-40s, so that has shaped a lot of my story. Uh, my father passed away when I was 17, and in the last 17 years, I've lost all three of my brothers to cancer. Uh, so that's been shaping. And um, uh, because of my age and kind of like the developmental realities of my life and family and so forth, I was uh, around people... I mean, I I was uh, around people who were dying early in my life and often just because of kind of the nature of where I showed up in my family. Um, uh, There has been a, uh, there have been literally infinite numbers of ways in which God has graced my life with life, though, uh, not least of which my my wife of over 35 years, Phyllis, and we have two kids, a daughter who's 21, uh, two daughter who's 31 and a son who's 28, um, whom I love fiercely and who uh, teach me every day that even when your children are adults, you still want to be in charge of their life. And, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're still trying to train me in learning how not to be in charge of your adult children's lives. And uh, so... Uh, uh, anyway, not encouraging me right now. I've got there. an eight-year-old, <laughs> seven-year-old, and a two-year-old. So far, I've got the upper hand, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will be 38, 37, and 32, <laughs> and you will want to run their life. Uh, uh, I, I say this with just uh, the, the radiation of gratitude. And I, and I would also say that I... Uh, I said earlier, I don't deserve my life. And I, and I, and I think that one of... Uh, if, if I were to say, well, what is the... What, what might be like the the signature uh, uh, thing that represents that reality is that I I have friends in my life and th- these are some of these are work friends that I work with these are friends that are in my circle that I've known everything from since I was twelve to people that I've known closely over the last thirty five years uh, friends who uh, do not leave me alone friends who mm. come to find me friends uh, I, I, a collection of people by whom like who know me well enough, like there's, there's nothing that they don't know. And, uh, and if we, and without them, I'm a dead man. And, um, this to me is, uh, this is what the body of Christ is to be, is to be this right. forming, shaping, loving, caring, disciplining, uh, uh, body that helps us practice for heaven. Wow. And not least of which, um, when everything about the world we're living in uh, tempts us to believe that evil has the last word. 
Yeah. Uh, not just not just in a big landscape of political and racial rancor and fracture and all the things, but in the in the center of my own soul, the parts of, the parts of me that I would much rather kill than Jesus take the time and effort to redeem. It just be a lot simpler to just like give them like to euthanize them. Yeah, and then I wouldn't have yeah. to like I wouldn't have to put up with me. Right, and then I would know that my like my wife wouldn't have to put up with me, my kids wouldn't have to put up with me, and the part of me that wants to run their life as adults and all all the things. So <laughs> that's long winded. That's trying to answer your question there. No, it's so. I mean, it's so appropriate. That's that's where people are coming, and they're and and they're they're almost buying into that belief that evil has had the last word in their life, and they're looking yeah. for some kind of glimmer of hope that that's not the case, mm-hmm. and that's why they're tuning in right now, and. Mm. Um, and and that's why I appreciate you, hmm. you know, in the in the work that you're doing. You know, one of the things that we we talk we've talked about before on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast this idea of, you know, psychology and faith and the the combination of those things. It's the thing that you really seem to specialize in in terms of the work that you do and your writing and you really bring those two into marrying. I know historically the church has tried to divorce those two things and say, well, well, our faith is over here and science is over here. And again, I say this every time we talk about this topic, science to me should not be something that disproves Christianity. It's something that says, oh, that's how God created things to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we discover Mm -hmm. those things, we discover more of who God is and more of who we are, and we can have a more Mm -hmm. intimate relationship with Him and with others. And that's what you talk about so much as you're writing. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder you know as just in your own story how how did you how did, how has your own story kind of colored this journey to discover more of that to discover more of like how our minds and our faith and our heads and our hearts and how god created how all those things integrate and intertwine mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah well you know the, i think the, the the way i would begin the, the, my uh, response to your question is, uh, you know, one of the things that we say that we do in, in the work that we do in our practice uh, is that we, our, our job is to help people tell their stories more truly. Mm. When we say that Jesus, when Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, uh, it's, he's not, uh, the, you know, the word truth is not just limited to factual, you know, positional truth. It's this notion that in me, in relationship with me, you sense, you feel, you like you sense in your chest the way you know you should be, like you want to be living. Like yeah. there's, that, that's yeah. true. Like, like when a piano is tuned truly, that kind of mm. true. And so we want people's stories to reflect this. Part of the challenge is that uh, in order to do this, you know, our, our trauma and our losses uh, uh, often for which we have not uh, healed well from, uh, leave us uh, with coping strategies right. that make it difficult for us to imagine that life can be any other way than what it is. And so part of our role in our practice, and I would say part of our role as believers being in the world, but our role as a practice our role is to help expand people's imagination until they are able to catch up to it. And mm. this is what I think Jesus does when he comes. This is what, yeah. I mean, this is what the God of the Bible was doing with every encounter that he has. Like he gets to Abraham, Abraham's, you know, living in a Near Eastern ritualist, you know, religious ritual cult. And the God of Elohim comes along, like it, it, like it, it starts blowing his mind. And the same thing for Moses. And then the same thing for the prophets. And then Jesus comes along and does the same thing. And it's been this excursion of expanding our imagination. Why am I saying all this? Because I was born into a world in which for many, many years, the separation of things like faith and science from each other had been well established. Yeah. Uh, But I think I, I kind of came into a world in which there were enough people who were uh, aware of this and invited me to begin to imagine, wait a minute, Kurt, what if uh, the fact that we separate these things in and of itself isn't a self-evident fact about science and about faith? What if that's being told by a different story that got started four or 500 years ago Mm -hmm. that doesn't really have to do with either one of them? Hmm. But that has to do with a guy named Descartes and it has to do with a lot of other things that were taking place 
And so I, I say this to our listeners, like, why is this important? Because, you know, it wasn't just that people were introducing me to new ideas about this whole notion that like everything about the world that is true is true in Jesus, which means science is true, faith is true. Right. It wasn't just yeah. that people were giving me these new ideas. It was the relationships I had with the people yeah. from which the ideas come. And as we like to say, like, I, I don't just trust your information. I trust your information because, first of all, like, I see your facial expression and I hear your tone of voice. And I find in you someone that I wish I wasn't talking with over the Internet. Yeah. I find in you someone that I wish I was talking with in the room. And that, that you are believable means that the ideas that you're going to talk about are worthy of me considering, worthy of me like expanding my imagination as you start to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, and I, and so I enter into this, like as a guy who like temperamentally, I'm a guy who worries a lot if I'm not right. If I don't have like every T crossed, every I dotted to make sure I worry that I'm going to be wrong and you're going to find out that I'm wrong. And then you're going to like publicly humiliate. I mean, these, this is kind of taken to extremes, but like, I, I, you know, I don't know if this is a good thing to know that this is what a psychiatrist thinks in his own head, but you know, <laughs> so be it. But this whole notion of wanting to be right and wanting to make sure that I have all that stuff figured out was a long time, like big, you know, important to me. And how do we know that science and faith all work together? Until it became, uh, until in some of these relationships, they, people would ask me the question, well, wait a minute, you know, what is your worry about knowing everything, what science says? And they're mm -hmm. like, what's that all about? And as it turns out, that's not about, do I have the right information and the right amount of it? It's ultimately about the question of like, well, what if I happen to be wrong at the end of the day? What my heart really wants to know is that even if I'm wrong, are you still going to love me? Wow. This is not about being right. This is about being loved. Now, it doesn't mean that being right is unimportant. Like laws of gravity are significant if I'm going to build a plane, yeah. right? But ultimately, why do I even build a plane? I'm building a plane because I really want to do good, beautiful, loving things to get people from one place to the other. Like it's really about relationships. Yeah. And so yeah. paying attention to that when I start to recognize that actually if I'm like, whether or not I'm loved is, is, is the thing that is guiding all the other questions about how right I am uh, is wow. something that I have to pay attention to in my own story of loss and grief and brokenness and, and like imperfection. I tell people I'm a professional sinner. I'm not, I'm not an amateur at this. Like I'm really good <laughs> at sinning. I'm a, I'm doing a, it for a while. I'm effective. <laughs> doing it for almost 60 years and I am good at it. Uh, and the, 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 with this in mind, I got, I have plenty of neural real estate that is mm -hmm. taken up by the parts of me that to this day still worry that I'm going to do something, say something wrong. And you're going to want to leave mm -hmm. and like leave, like catastrophically leave and go tell all your friends to have nothing to do with me kind of leave. Mm -hmm. And coming into a place where in which you're in, in a person in Jesus, we have a person who we, who we say holds together, like my experience of life such that I don't have to divide these things. Hmm. Because I think as you rightly say, faith isn't this abstract thing, as it turns out, faith is a way that we use. It's a word that we use to describe like a real experience with a real person. Right real real material person real embodied person right. and science it is a way that we describe the mechanics of how that all happens mm. that's great and so the story of what's happening between you and me we can talk about it in terms of oh this is how kurt trusts him when they're talking mm. And then we could go back and say, well, let's talk about the quantum mechanics of the light that passes through the internet, which the two of these gentlemen are talking to each other. That's like neuroscience. It's talking about the mechanics of things. Mm. But even beyond both of those is our desire to be speaking with one another and speaking to our audience yeah. such that those who are hearing uh, will be comforted, will be convicted, will be uh, commissioned Mm. loved joyfully wow. practicing for heaven wow that's so good i mean i just you know i think about this 
this idea that as cerebral as we want to get to try to deduce what really is what's going on in the material and what's going on in the abstract, like we really just want one thing. Mm. And that and that is to be loved, you know, as yeah. you're saying. And that is to be whole and yeah. to feel whole, you know? Right. To to feel like like we said at the beginning of this conversation, to feel like evil doesn't have the last word because it has fractured our lives. And not just know it cognitively, right? Right. But to but to, to know it right. deep down. Right. Right. And and that's where, you know, for me, what's I'm a little bit kind of a head person with you as well, in that as, the more I researched this stuff, the more I kind of engaged intellectually with science, mm. it began to color even more my faith and begin mm. to say, Oh wow, this is so helpful, especially and particularly during the season that I was trying to figure out and grapple my way through the dark and this healing from this major tragedy mm. that happened in my mm. life. Mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. can you, you know, that's, that's one of the things I, I know you're really passionate about is just how our brain functions when, and what happens when we undergo some kind of trauma. It doesn't have to be loss per se. You know, we've got a lot of people listening to this, that they're, experiencing all kinds of tra childhood trauma or sexual abuse or betrayal or, you know, mm -hmm. lots of the gamut mm. listening to this, but they're all mm. wondering, why do I feel this way after this experience? Or why, how, why can't I shake this? What's mm. going on with our brain? And mm. why is that affecting, mm. why is this trauma mm. affecting us? And, and then to that, how do we, how do we move through it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, th I think w one of the one of the ways that I respond to this is uh, by saying that um, you know we have we have some fundamental uh, emotions that we humans experience that uh, we might say we're we're relatively distressing. Uh, mm -hmm. Fear would be one. Anxiety would be one. Um, shame would be one. They're, 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 they're primal, they're fundamental, and they are distressing, but they are not overwhelming to a newborn or to an infant because when they start to emerge, uh, that child will tend to send up a signal. They're crying, they're doing, they're gonna tell you that they're in trouble. Yeah. And typically, if you're the parent and you're in earshot, you go to the child and you take steps to intervene. And so the child's capacity to have their distress regulated is what we would call done by a process of co-regulation. Mm. They can't do it by themselves. They actually need the comforting presence and all that that means interpersonally and neurobiologically of the other in order to see them, soothe them, comfort them, so forth and so on, and re-regulate. That's co-regulation. This sits with the text that we read in the second chapter of Genesis when God looks at everybody else and says, like, the zebra's got it, the camel's got it, even the toad's got it, but, like, this dude does not have what this dude needs. It's not good for the man to be alone. Yeah. And we would suggest that this is an anthropological statement that is not just a comment on the state of one guy in one plot of garden at a certain period of time. This is an anthropological statement that is a comment not just on a person, but on all of us. And not only that, but it, it, it speaks to the very nature of how each of our brains work. You know, I've got 100 billion neurons, you got 100 billion neurons, you know, they're, each one, they're all, they're pretty elegant, they can do some pretty amazing things, each one, but like, yeah. all by itself, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. When it, it is, is it being separated? where all the trouble starts. And when I'm anxious, when I'm the newborn, like when I'm distressed, like I sense my separation from something and the separation mm -hmm. is taking place, not so much physically, it's not like neurons start to pull apart from each other, but their capacity to connecting with each other in the way that they're intended to, even when we're mm -hmm. anxious, give us the sense that we are alone. Anxiety is primarily about the sense of being disconnected. Wow. Trauma, trauma, takes all of those primal distressing affects and accelerates them and distills them to maximal capacity. Hmm. And so a traumatic event is one in which literally 
the part of me that senses and images and feels and thinks, which are represented by different neural networks, different networks throughout the brain, different circuitries, and that eventually take up location and find themselves on the different sides of the brain, but not so much because the left and the right are primarily so different in all the ways that we sometimes imagine, but because, right. you know, that just happens to be where those, where those kind of connections land. Mm. Trauma disconnects the capacity of these networks that are typically able to talk to each other and regulate, co-regulate as I'm co-regulating with you. It disconnects that. And so if I'm a victim of everything from a bad traffic accident to a rape to, to childhood ongoing sexual abuse mm -hmm. or to deprivation, long-term deprivation, my neural networks will tend to do one of two things. They will tend to separate in their connectivity from each other. As you and I are also disconnected from each other. <clears throat> yeah. And or in cases of deprivation, they simply don't ever get the opportunity to learn to fire and do their work to begin with. I tell people it's kind of like if you have a beautiful vase that is on the table and you want to move it to another room. And I say, David, could you please pick that up and bring that with us? You just pick it up and bring it into the other room. But if the vase tips over and shatters into a hundred pieces, and then I say, could you please bring that with us? It's pretty tough to do. You'd, you'd yeah. need help in putting these pieces back together. And this is what trauma does. There is our vase, but it's shattered into a hundred pieces. How am I, how's the vase supposed to hold water? How's, how's it supposed to function when it's like this? It's going to need lots of support from perhaps more than one set of hands to right. get the vase to move from one room to the other. And so neurobiologically, trauma both gives us the felt sense of disintegration within my own mind. Yeah. The part of me that thinks doesn't connect always from the part of me that feels, doesn't connect well from the part of me that senses things in my physicality. Mm. I can sometimes have old emotional states from an unfinished, unhealed trauma suddenly intrude back into my present moment when it gets activated by something. People who have PTSD and flashbacks right. know about these kinds of things. We can also, and, and but, but the other thing that, I, that we tell people is that trauma doesn't just shatter my experience of myself now. It also shatters my capacity to appropriately perceive what has happened to me. Yeah, yeah. And so I have a trauma and at, you know, the perception that I have at some point includes me telling the story, if I had only done this, this, and this, or if I had not done this, this, or this, this would have never happened. Wow. Or the, the, or my perception is there's nothing I can do about this. Yeah. So your like, story is always skewed. It's always, always a... fixed. Right. And so I don't, I don't recognize that trauma hasn't just shattered my story. It shattered my a capacity to appropriately interpret my story right. for what right. it is, which is why it's so crucially important for us to be in connection with others yeah. who are going to help me tell my story more truly by yeah. helping me pick the pieces of the boss up and carry it into the room together, mm. put it back together. That takes time. You don't, you just like, it's not ready to hold water. Like in the next two hours, it's going to take time to put that back together. Yeah. But I think some of the other things that we're learning about the brain, you know, when I was in medical school, uh, you know, now almost 40 years ago, you know, if you, you know, on the, on the neuro, on the neurology ward, if you had a stroke, you know, you were on the unit for <laughs> six weeks and we did PT and OT for, you know, a couple times a day. And then we sent you home and wished you good luck. Wow. Uh, but now, if you were to have a stroke, we send you to a rehab center where we're going to work you 10 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, because we believe that the brain has the capacity to recruit and create new neurons in ways that we didn't, we really weren't aware it was able to do, you know, 40 years ago. And I would say that this is, this is all very good news, and it is completely consistent with the work that we, that we read about when Jesus talks about making all things new. Yeah, that this isn't just metaphor. It's not just figures of speech, right. but it's for real, and it's taking place in real brains and bodies and relationships yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That there's a there there is an actual physical healing reconstruction that is taking place 
when you're appropriately working through your trauma or appropriately inviting people into those spaces, safe people into those spaces. Um, and, 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 it, and that is what is, is truly going to help you, you know, heal from these things. Mm-hmm. And I, I, what I love, um, I love this, this idea you keep going back to with connection, hmm. you know, even just kind of off, offhand referencing the disconnection between you and I, right? I mean, mm-hmm. there is a certain angst involved with being on Zoom. Yep. Yep. It's become normal for us, right? It's yep. become normal. Yep. And, and and it's convenient. How convenient is it that we can, I don't have to hop in a plane and fly to wherever you are and, you know, mm. sit down mm. with you in a room. However, mm. there is a certain level of, ah, this just doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This right. isn't right. Right. I remember early in the pandemic, I wrote an essay on this, uh, this, this notion, this, this idea that uh, I, I think the title was a body of work. And this, this idea that when, when we were first beginning to have to encounter this and Zoom was kind of new to everybody and mm-hmm. within the first two to probably four or five months, you know, there was just a lot of complaint about fatigue, Zoom fatigue. We heard about it early mm-hmm. on before people kind of got used to this as kind of the new norm. And I, I wrote about, we, we talk about this, this notion of how like the body knows better. Yeah. Like when I'm looking at you, like I, if, if this is something that I did, you know, a couple times a year, that's one thing that's fine. But if I had to do this all the time, my mind, typically, if we're in the room together, uh, there's a lot that you and I are ta- saying to each other that are, that we aren't using words for. And uh, that's, that's very helpful for our, like, I know that you're comfortable yeah. with me because of what your body is saying to my body in this way, like all the communication yeah. that happens. And now, like, I'm, I'm looking for this, and I can't find it, because, right. you know, and, and, you're, and, and you and can't find it. And so th- we, it's distressing. Yeah. yeah. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, we, we, run these, we run these confessional communities, uh, these, these groups in our practice, and, and we have recently been bringing people back together. And uh, we had this uh, this moment that has now been re- replicated on a number of occasions. We had a moment, the very first group that we brought back into the room that has been away for two years, practically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're on a Zoom call with eight other people and you're talking right. to, and you're looking at them and they're looking at you. But if you're talking to the screen, you're just talking to the screen and you're kind of looking at one person and then the other and so forth and so on. But you really, as far as your brain is concerned, you're really just kind of talking to the screen and these people who are disembodied and so forth. Right. The first evening that this group was back in the room together, uh, one of the participants uh, started to talk, and they are two or three sentences into just offering some reflections, and they stopped. And they said, I just have to say, like, this is suddenly very uncomfortable for me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because before, you can talk, and you can see all these faces on a screen, and your body doesn't have the sense that there are eight people who are looking at you. And now you're back in the room and every single sight line is directed at you. And the felt presence Mm. of others is a new thing. And, And it reminds me of like, oh, this is to have that felt sense of distress because the world is now more real. Yeah. Uh, you know, reminds me of the great divorce where, you know, the people get off the bus and they can't tolerate how real heaven is. We sometimes, you know, we can't tolerate the gaze of Jesus, the rich young ruler in Mark's gospel. And he looked at him and loved him. And somehow the ruler missed the look. Or was he just not able to take it? Hmm. And this, this is, I mean, when it comes to trauma, this is part of the, part of what's tricky in our healing because the very thing that we most long for, right, connection, understanding, all the things, are the circumstances in which my trauma has taken place, and my, you know, my brain remembers, and the very thing yeah. that I most need uh, from you is the thing that I'm most terrified of at the same yeah. time, and so it takes a lot of courage and a lot of practice and a lot of time to slowly put my, get my foot back in the pool where I nearly drowned. Wow. 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 This is where shame comes in, right? This Mm. is where the idea Mm. of, okay. Yeah. I mean, just as you said, the very thing that I need in order to heal is this reconnection, this presence. Yeah. Excuse me. And we talk quite a bit about 
the necessity of the presence of God, you know, carrying us through through this, right? And and right. He comforts us in these moments in ways that nobody else can, and yet He's also surrounded us with community, or He is intended to surround us with community that's going to help heal some of those fractured places of our heart as well. And as you say, the felt presence of both of those things can simultaneously be comforting and distressing all at the same mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And, and and we get to choose then which one of those feelings we're going to lean into right in order right. to find now but 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 this idea of shame tends mm-hmm. to rear its its ugly head and we all experience it to different degrees mm-hmm. different levels and manifesting in different ways mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. can can you kind of talk I mean you talk a lot about this um, as, as kind of an undercurrent to mm-hmm. to all of this that mm-hmm. that shame mm-hmm. creates this disintegration, this barrier mm-hmm. between us and the healing that we so need. Mm-hmm. Can you dissect that a little bit? How do we overcome that shame? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it, it does. And I mean, part of it is a function of the fact that, uh, you know, we I describe in one of my books how shame actually begins to kind of take up residence within us as early as 15 to 18 months of age. Mm. So long before we have language, so it's it's a felt neurobiological, neurophysiological event. It's not just about oh, I feel ashamed because uh, what I did on the test, or because I lied to my parents, or the like. Those are those are things are all true, but that's not how it begins. It begins as this felt thing that is distressing to me, and I long before I have words to help me make sense of it and figure out what it is. I, I am embedded in it, and then I just find coping strategies for it, find ways to distract, disconnect from it. And so I've been at it for a long time. And evil wields this in such a way that it then gets attached to lots of things. And what evil does most effectively is that it attaches, it literally splices neural activity of shame together with a lot of the things that we do in our life that are actually acts of beauty and goodness. Wow. And so I remember... You know, and, 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 and temperament is part of it and so forth. But like, I, I remember, you know, I grew up in a house where I had really loving parents. I said, you know, I grew up in a loving Christian home, right? Where we say, that's code for life sucked, but we're not really allowed to talk about it. <laughs> you know. Wow. And, uh, wow. Um, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not completely true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that some people really do. And and, and I would say that if, if anybody were to have been watching, you know, the, the you know, the, the the film footage of my house, you know, you'd yeah. be hard, you'd be hard pressed to think that I had that, that there was a moment of difficulty in my childhood. Yeah, I had God fearing parents who were affectionate with me care. I, I don't have any questions about that. And mm. at the same time, I had a dad who didn't have much practice knowing what it means to be curious relationally mm. about people. So like he and I didn't have a single conversation that I would consider to have been meaningful growing up. Oh, wow. So without knowing it, there is a part of my mind that is like looking for my father's voice, but I don't know that I'm doing that. And it's not now until oh. I'm in my fifties when everybody else in my family is dead that I'm wondering like, where the heck were you? Mm. And I have a mom who, again, deeply committed follower of Jesus, all the things, right, that, that were wonderful, and was anxious, and was, a, you know, kind of grew up as a functional orphan, and had her own set of traumas that I am pretty confident, you know, had leftover work that never got, never got tended to. And I ended up, in many respects, serving as, you know, kind of like an emotional confidant for her in ways that I never should have. Mm. And so, and then I, I'm in this place where like, oh, I, I, and, and to make sure that she's not upset, I can't talk with her about all my existential angst about faith. Right. So what does that all mean? It means I then create a story Hmm. in which part of the thread is that there's something wrong with me, A, for feeling bad the way that I do. Hmm. When, as it turns out, the reason I was feeling so much of what I felt was because I was disconnected from my dad and from my mom in ways that I shouldn't have been. But I don't know this. And like, they're doing the best they can. Like, this is not about, nobody's throwing anybody under the bus here, right? right? But this is my life and I now have to contend with it. And so shame finds a way, well, okay, well, Kurt, you can do this and you can do that and you have certain skill sets you do, but like, it's always attached to, well, are you doing that well enough? 
And are you giving Jesus enough credit for where you've, you know, for where you're doing the things that people are giving you credit and like all the things like, so you're, 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 I, I, I grow up like wondering when the next shoe's going to drop. Yeah. But you don't tell anybody that because of course you're ashamed of being ashamed. Right. Right. So it's only kind of like, you know, it's self reinforcing and you know, this is the thing. Uh, people can be really effective in life. And uh, evil is more than happy to use our gifts uh, and use shame to hijack it. Uh, and and then when we find ourselves uh, really pain in, 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 in painfully deep water, uh, then we somehow feel ashamed that somehow we shouldn't be here. Like, look at all the things about my life that are good. I shouldn't be here. And so what do I have to complain about? And, you know, Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, I haven't, you know, my wife was not murdered with, you know, with an invasion, a home invasion. Like, what do I have to complain about? Yeah. And this is what evil counts on. Yeah. Because it's credit your trauma or that you. Right. And as long as I can discredit small things, then I practice discrediting everything. That's right. Which ultimately means if I don't have the experience of God's mercy, even in those small things, eventually I'm not going to be able to be empathic and be an agent of God's mercy with anybody else's small, let alone big things. Mm. Wow. Because I can't give people what I don't have. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So you began making up a story. Yeah. This is what we all, this is what we all do. Yeah. We're making up a story. We're seeing our story from a very skewed lens. Um, yeah. And we're pretty brilliant at crafting those stories, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, by default. And it, and culture doesn't help us with that. Hmm. At least, you know, hmm. non-faith culture, especially nowadays, there is a very trendy phrase that people will throw out. And I don't know why people necessarily throw this out. Maybe it's a, for an attempt to not feel or cast judgment, but it's, that's my truth. Mm. And and you have your mm. truth. Mm. Mm. And mm. it's, I feel like it's a very crafty, um, mm. you know, trendy piece of uh, colloquialism mm. that we, we have now slipped into because it, it's easier. It feels easier to just kind of like, well, this is, this is how I see things and this, that's how you see things. And, but there, how does that hinder us? You know, to what degree is our story needing to be aligned with some kind of, as you said earlier, this, this true, hmm. you know, standard or this true, you know, as you, as you said, like hmm. the, the tuning fork, you know, there's hmm. a, there's a certain resonance that it has right. to align with. Right. Well, you know, you, you, this, you, you bring up a really good point. And like your example is really poignant because in that moment where a person would say, well, that's my truth or that's your truth, whatever, we, we might say that, you know, what they're really doing when they say that, one, one way to describe what's happening in the room is that that person is using those words in that sentence as a way to regulate their emotional state. Like they're uncomfortable with something. And this is what I'm going to say to reduce my distress. Mm. Now, if we were to say, wait a minute, I really want you to just tell me more truly what your story is. They could at that moment say, this is what I believe. And I'm also like afraid to tell you that. Mm. Wow. And I'm afraid that when you hear that, you're going to either think I'm an idiot or you're going to think I'm a terrorist. And either you're going to leave me because you think I'm not worth listening to because I'm an idiot, or you're going to find a way to kill me because you think I'm a terrorist. I mean, these things figuratively, wow. right? Yeah. But I'm afraid. And then the reality is, not only do I not want to be afraid, I really want to be your friend. Yeah. I really, I, I want to be, I like ideally want to be connected to you. I, I really, I, yeah. I, I want to do that. So in this most recent book, The Soul of Desire, we talk about like we are people of desire. And, and one, one of the things that evil does by using shame and trauma is that it wants to shear off and interrupt our awareness of, A, that we are people of desire, 
yeah. such that even if we are aware of it, we're just becoming people of devouring rather than people of desire. Wow. But it also doesn't want us to say or to imagine or to or to get the hint that like even in the middle of a conflict or in the middle of a fight, like with our spouse or with our kid or with whoever, that what we're, what's underneath my fight mm. is a longing. Mm. At the end, I want to say, I really, I really would like to be liked by you. Yeah. That's what I would love. I would love. To, I would love to know that you want to be in the room with me and that I want to be in the room with you. And of course you would probably say the same thing. Like ideally, like we would say like, no, yeah. I like that. That's what I, I want to be in the room with you. And I would go further and say, and it scares the living daylights out of me, even to tell you to this much, that. to yeah. even say this much. Yeah. Now here's the thing. Wow. The very act of saying these things, which are truly acts of great vulnerability are yeah. also some of the most liberating and powerful things that we can do. And evil yeah. does not want us doing this stuff. Mm. Because in many respects, those kinds of acts are small recapitulations of Good Friday. Mm. Wow. Good Friday is an act of vulnerability. Wow. It's an act of vulnerability. And of course, when we say, here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking. And I'm afraid to tell you this because I'm afraid you're going to do this. That's like Good Friday. And we are trusting that on the other side of that Easter is coming. I can't know it for sure. Jesus is trusting that three wow. days hence, his father's coming for him. Wow. And evil wants to insert in every act of creative goodness and beauty the fear that our dad's not coming. And so we have to be reminded mm. that Jesus is coming for us. And the way we do it is by coming for each other. Wow. And that's how Jesus becomes believable to me. Yeah. I can believe that he's coming for me because you do. They'll know you're my disciples when they see you coming for each other. Yeah, you love. Wow. That's so good, Kurt. Whew. And it's our traumatized selves that are just so deeply longing for someone to come for us, while at the same time, they're often really quite frightened of the very same thing. And so we who are also the ones who we're coming to find— it's incumbent upon us to practice being aware of how patient we must be while we are simultaneously recognizing how patient God is like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I just turned 59 and you know there there are things I'm discovering. I my 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 oldest brother, the third of my three brothers who died, died in in 2018. And you know they're just it's just true uh, that you there's certain things you you can't talk about in your family until certain people are dead. Mm. And in my case, it was everybody. <laughs> because once certain people are dead, then you don't have to worry about getting into trouble if certain things are talked about and it never gets back to them. Yeah. And certain things started to be <clears throat> said and. I started to discover some things, you know, not least of which how much anger I've been carrying around for 50 plus years. Mm. And you're like, and I'm like, oh, and I've seen where this anger has shown up in this place and that place and so forth and so on. And of course, I'm thinking like, well, why, why wasn't this brought to my attention when I was like 18 or when I was 24 or other times in my marriage? Like, so that like, I and others around me wouldn't have had to benefit from my professional sin sinnerhood. <laughs> and like, I can imagine having this conversation, you know, in the new heaven and earth. And Jesus says, well, well, actually, we actually did try to have that conversation. Do you remember <laughs> when you were here? And we had it, we tried to have it again here. And like, I can, I can imagine him saying it gently and without apology, but without condemnation. And there's a sense in which we, 
we can't, it, it's hard for us. When Jesus says to his disciples before his crucifixion, he says, there's, there's certain things in John's gospel, there's certain things that I want to tell you, but you're not able to bear them at this time. Mm. In the healing of our trauma, there are certain things, I mean, we can only bear the healing process a little bit at a time. Yeah. yeah. I can't get all the vase back together all at once. The structure is fragile enough in its having been broken that it can't tolerate all that we would expect of it in a fully healed vase. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, you know, with some of my patients, I'm like, chop, chop. <laughs> Let's what, are you, what, are you, what are you waiting for? Like all you're, all you're doing is demonstrating that I'm not an effective enough therapist. Like, <laughs> what the heck? But so this, this sense of, of patiently uh, being present as we allow ourselves the grace of God's patience with us at the same time. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I was, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say this. I was with, yeah. I was at lunch, I was at lunch today with one of my closest friends who's been in this circle of friends that I'm so grateful for, for 30 plus years. And I said to him this very thing, I said, Neil, I, uh, it, it completely flummoxes me why you're still here. But he is. Wow. Wow. You know, what's what's interesting about what you're saying right there, you know, this whole idea of, of Jesus having these conversations or, or attempting to have conversations with us and us being a little bit slow in the process and him being patient with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I feel like that as I was really trying to figure out how to walk through losing my wife, I, um, there were some things that the Lord brought up to me about me hmm. had almost nothing to do with the situation. Yep. I mean, yep. as I look back at it, I don't think it had anything to do with the situation. You know, here yep. I am. If you were to look at the story and go, wow, he was a victim of this situation entirely. And yet the Lord chose to use this aftermath season to lovingly point out some things in me mm -hmm. that that need to be healed and sanctified. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. And I I I was frustrated with that. I'm like, oh no, I'm just trying to heal from the loss of All right. Right my on, best bro. friend. And 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 now you're like you're bristling some things here. There's some new woundings yeah. coming up and there's some new, you know, and and yeah. Yep. You know, I don't know if you have any commentary on that. I guess I'm now s stating this as if you're my therapist going, what, how do you explain <laughs> this? How do you, it doesn't, it doesn't compute with me. And yeah. yet, is there an intention, I guess, of the father to, you know, in all situations, he wants holiness mm. for us. Yeah. Right? Well, gosh, if we had uh, you know a couple more hours, I, 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 I could I could say I could say more about this very thing that literally just happened in this same conversation with my Neil, with my friend Neil at lunch today. This we we found ourselves in one of those places where, uh, you know, I, I'm in a certain space in life right now where there are a couple of things that are happening that are making me a little uncomfortable, and Neil's helping me walk through that. And in the course of this, in which I am tempted to feel a bit like a victim about certain things, mm. Neil's also like becomes, you know, Jesus voice uh, and saying, well, here's some things that I'm actually seeing that it's revealing about some things that you do. And I'm like, mm. what? Wait, no, no, hold on. <laughs> right, right. And then he starts to tell me some things and they are things that I am like completely oblivious to. Wow. But that are completely true. They're completely oh. true. They're completely true. And as he spoke them, like it was like gentle, firm, kind, tears in his eyes and a revelation, like somebody's just pulling the curtain back. Wow. And, you know, so, but I think for me, neurobiologically, and as we like to say, like mechanically, mm -hmm. I think there's some mechanics that if we think about them can be helpful in this. So as we said earlier, when we have trauma or shame, when we have, you know, things that happen to us, 
that are unpleasant uh, and we don't repair those ruptures effectively, we're going to do whatever we can to reduce our distress as expeditiously as possible. That's what the brain does. Yeah, right, right. And so I'm going to uh, literally develop a, 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 an entire array of neural networks that are designed uh, to help me function in the world. And part of their design necessarily includes their capacity to dis disconnect me from things that are unpleasant that I don't want to sense or image or feel or think about. Mm. Survival. Exactly. Yeah. But we effectively bury those things. We contain them. And we literally neurally develop networks whereby which I function and there may be these things that are down there, but I'm disconnecting myself from that. It doesn't mean that they're not there because every time this experience comes up again, I'm doing the same thing and those things want to come to the surface and I'm working really hard to reinforce my self-protection from these things that I could, uh, that I might otherwise be aware of. Yeah. And then, and then, I'll, but, but what we're not aware of is that in so doing, I'm burning a fair amount of energy containing my wounds. Literally, I'm burning neural energy. I'm burning neurobiological energy containing wounds, energy that is then not available for me to create beauty and goodness in the world. It's part of my budget that is being siphoned off to pay for all my trips to McDonald's <laughs> that I could be using to go to the gym. But I'm I'm doing something else. Trauma disrupts neural circuitry in such a way that that circuitry that was effectively buried and from which I have cut myself off of conveniently in order to protect now is made more available to me and to my awareness. Hmm. And hence, in these in these traumatic moments. We have the emergence of new growth. I mean, this is this is like what happens in large forest fires. Wow. We have the emergence of new growth, and it's like, why? Like that 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 that's a horrible thing that just happened to that forest. Yeah. And then you see this new stuff that starts to sprout that otherwise would not have been available. Mm. And I, you know, my sense is that there are certain things that do happen that that God is present in. Uh, in, in which he's fully present, even in our traumas, wanting to do everything he possibly can to bring healing and new generation mm -hmm. out of those very spaces where you thought it was all primarily about your being a victim, kind of like the things I was naming for my friend Neil today. Right. And then, and we're saying like, well, it's true that these things are happening and this isn't easy. And let me invite you to consider some additional things that I'm seeing. Wow. Wow. And I suppose if you are keen on writing your story or writing your real story, you know, telling it in a true way and aligning it with God's story, then your heart is open to receiving those things a lot more. And so it's, if God's an opportunist, right? I mean, that sounds mm. very bad to say that, but if, he is in some ways he's going to leverage that opportunity to yeah where our heart is soft to say hey here's some other things right wow and i think that for me like oh. today like for instance he was able to do that because it's being done again in it's not you know it's not like he he just show it shows up with an email like yeah. it shows up in the presence of my friend in neil a, with yeah, tears in his eyes right. about these things right, right? exactly yeah. and that was probably a very um almost spontaneous moment. You know, that probably wasn't something he had shown up planning to do. It was just, this is where the spirit is leading in this moment right now. And this is the moment to take this That's right. opportunity. You know, I know we don't have much time at all left, but I, I, I do want, because I feel like this coincides so much with these confessional communities that you talk mm -hmm. about a lot. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about community and how necessary it is in terms of, you know, the enemy's biggest ploy is to try to get us to, uh, to be isolated. Right. And to think that we're the only one going through what we're going through. And yeah. yet there are other people that are going through the same thing. And there are other people who are not, but as you've said, can be there as empaths mm. 
mm-hmm. to also be conduits of the grace of God in these moments for us. Mm-hmm. Can you mm-hmm. explain to us what's the distinction in confessional communities versus what we just conventionally talk about with community, church community or whatever? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I, I, I tell folks routinely that <clears throat> in many respects, uh, there's very little if if you want to pan out and and take a broad look at these confessional communities there's very little that happens in these confessional communities that in some way shape or form does not happen in any social interchange we have it could be our small group at church it could be the social interchange you have with the checkout clerk at your grocery store Mm -hmm. there are certain rules of engagement there are certain ways in which we are going to choose to be and not be and so forth and so on in a confessional community, some of those rules of engagement that apply to every social interaction, every social system that we have, are simply made much more intentional because our purpose, our primary purpose for being in the room with this group is to ultimately work to develop depth and connection in the relationships that are in the room. Mm. That's probably not my primary purpose of what I'm doing as I stand in the checkout line at Safeway. Right. I want to be kind. I want mm. to be curious. Yeah. But I'm not taking my groceries through in order to build a relationship with Judy. That's not really what I'm there for. That's what we are here for. But the thing is, even when we enter these confessional communities, many people uh, we talked about these different stages that people go through because many people still enter into them and they think, oh, I'm coming to this group in order to get information and help in order to go live in my real life that's outside this group. Hmm. And then at some point they reach a second stage in which they discover, oh, I'm not alone with the stuff that I'm having to deal with outside this group. And, I'm, and so now I have support and I have a group of people that are like-minded and so forth. And so now the work that I'm doing is to really connect with these folks in order to go live my real life outside of this group. Mm. And at some point, the penny drops Mm. because the people in the group will recognize I'm so comfortable here that now I'm just being my true, like my real self, like more and more and more of me that is real and unvarnished comes into the room. And the more of me and the more of you that come into the room that are unvarnished, the more likely it is that I'm going to piss you off. (laughs) the more likely I'm going to say something that's going to be upsetting. Like we're, we're going to notice some things. You're, and at some point, the work that happens in the room is the work of, oh, I want to talk about what's happening between you and me right now. Or somebody else says, wait a minute, Kurt, like what's going on between you and Sarah? What's going on between you and David? Like what, what's happening? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm here to talk about my life that exists. out. Like, no, something's happening right here and now. You know, I, I, you, you get this sense in, in, in when you imagine Jesus collecting these disciples along the way that it's easy for us to think, oh, he's gathering up a group of people that he can teach certain principles to so that when he's gone, they can go then teach more people and they can teach more people and they can go teach more people. We forget that the primary thing that was happening in that space was that Jesus was collecting people into a group who largely, many of whom, didn't like each other. Wow. Yeah. And he's saying the work, like, I'm going to teach you all this stuff, but the stuff I'm teaching you is in order for you to employ it and to appropriate it right here. Right here. Wow. Right here in this group. And they're going to know that, like, because they're going to know that something's up. If I can get Peter the fisherman and Matthew the tax collector to love one another, if you can get, if you can get James and John to love Mary the prostitute, and to do so in a way that does not just re-victimize her. Like, mm-hmm. people are going to look around and say, like, something's up with this. And, wow. you, and, and, and that kind of work does not happen. Oh, this is going to sound, oh gosh. That kind of work cannot happen only by preaching to 3,000 people once a week. Wow. So true. Because uh, preaching to 3,000 people once a week is like the, the, is the first phase of the group. I'm going to come and be in this space. I'm going to get what I need and go home to live in my real life. 
Yeah. But it keeps me from the opportunity of doing the hard transitional work, transformational work of being in the room with somebody that I'm pissing off yeah. in the room that is disappointing me in the room that I really like. And I'd like to sleep with, but she's not my wife. And so what do I do with all that stuff that's happening in the room? Well, I can just kind of go white knuckle it. No, nope, because that's about things that are way beyond just between what's happening between you and that woman. Wow. Wow. And so I, 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 I don't know that I'm answering your question effectively the way you no. wanted me to, but I, I, I just, I, I would just say that what we want in these confessional groups, you know, of course, there's things <clears> about, <throat> we, we want people to be confidential. We want people to do, you know, they don't talk to each other outside the group because they want to keep their relationship confined right. to that space and distill it and concentrate it. Um, and one of the, one of the primary things that happens there too, is that, uh, you know, in individual psychotherapy, if you're seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist individually, the, you know, the patient comes and is going to get help from the therapist. And mm -hmm. the patient is maybe, we, we, we hope that they find that that's helpful work. But as Carl Menninger once fa famously said, when he was asked, like, what's the one, what's the first thing you tell your depressed patients to do when they're, when they're depressed? And he said, I tell them to leave their house, lock their door, go find a person who's far worse off than they are and do whatever you can do to help them. Because part of our healing includes my capacity to be a conduit of healing and help for others That's and great. not, yeah. and not primarily by my wit and my wisdom, but primarily right. by my own vulnerability. And so if somebody sees me individually, I can be helpful for them, but they don't get much of an opportunity to recognize that they're helping me very much. But when they're in a group, they get the opportunity to recognize how their vulnerability becomes a furrow that they are plowing behind which others come and know healing. And as St. Paul says, in my weakness, strength floods into the room. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'm so, I'm so glad that you mentioned that there at the end, that part of our healing uh, is almost contingent on us taking our pain, turning it around to help other people. Right. Because Eventually. we get so we get so focused on ourselves and our own pain. We can start navel gazing. We start mm -hmm. turning inward, which is our natural human bent. And of course it's very much our, our bent when we're undergoing some kind of pain or trauma or distress. And yet the Lord keeps inviting us to turn outward and to go and help and to go and serve and to go and be vulnerable in this. And, and that is going to be a key to our healing. Uh, we, we say it this way. It's just very short and concise pain to purpose. Mm, mm, mm. You know, mm. there's a repurposing that is happening in us, through us. And then as God invites us into mm. purpose and we start to step into that purpose, that, you know, that, that redeeming, redemp you know, the redemptive purpose that he has for us, then, then we continue to heal. Mm. And, um, mm. man, I love that you, I love mm. that you mm. laid that out right there. Mm. You know, your, your latest book is the soul of desire, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you've got several other books that are out there, other pieces of work and writing and, but, you know, we would love to know, um, where we can follow you, where we can mm. yeah. connect with you, um, where we can hear more from you. I wish I could sit down mm. and have a two more hours of conversation with you right now. Right on. Yeah. This has been mm. phenomenal. Mm. And, but mm. I, I just hate that we mm. have to, we have to yeah. cut this yeah. short yeah. here. Well, um, you can, uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, yeah. follow me there, but, and also, uh, I have a, uh, we have our, uh, podcast the being known podcast myself mm. and pepper sweeney do that and we're just now starting to rec we're beginning to record our fourth season we're early at this we just uh, the first season uh, debuted back in march of 2021 and so that uh, and i think uh that the podcast in many respects uh, gives people an opportunity to have an ongoing uh um, introduction to and exposure to the kind of yeah. work that i do so that's 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 yeah. one thing and then um there's a this small nonprofit that I uh, started a few years ago called the Center for Being Known. And for people who are interested in um, these confessional communities and ways that we're trying to develop 
you know, forms to export this in into the world um, the best way that we can. Uh, you can look at thecbk.org, the Center for Being Known, thecbk.org. Uh, you can check out. It's a small website where uh, we've, we've just had our first annual conference last October, so we're gaining some traction, cool. and we're really, um, really grateful and pleased for that. So those are some ways to keep track of me. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been an honor to have a conversation with mm. you, and I hope we get to do thank it you. again. I would love it's to just, do that. Yeah. Indeed. Right on. It'd be so great. Indeed. Thanks for joining us today. You bet. My pleasure. Thanks, David.